15. Well, where better to celebrate the art of brilliant speaking than at 5 by 15? And I'm thrilled that the three speakers we've already seen tonight exemplify one of the key messages that I have when talking about public speaking, which is that there is no standard. And I, don't, I mean that in a nice way. <laughs> there is no ideal. You know, the three speakers we've already seen tonight they could not be more different. From Dr. Hannah Critchlow, we had this incredibly engaging masterclass in public education, a, a subject which I didn't, I had known nothing about, and she had me gripped with every single word, and speaking away from the podium with no notes. Then we have Jonathan Friedland with this incredible burst of journalistic storytelling that means so much to him and lots of beautiful little ad libs uh, that engaged us and gave us a little bit of catharsis about the current moment. And then uh, from Johnny Pitts, the most wonderful, authentic moment, sincerity, poetry, admitting to us that he finds this difficult, that he's nervous, that he hates the standard that he might be being measured against. And in telling us that, we love him more. So that was beautiful for me to see, that illustration of there is no brilliant way to be a public speaker apart from being yourself. So thank you to all three of you for demonstrating that so brilliantly. <laughs> so, How to Own the Room, Women and the Art of Brilliant Speaking. It's a book, it's a podcast, it's my life's work, it's a mission. And I conceived it really with one person in mind, the one person who most needs to access this message of finding the voice that everyone needs to listen to. And I tried for three years to get it into her hands and still I don't think it's reached Theresa May. And guys, it's too late now. Uh, so why me? Why this message? And, and why for women? And it's interesting already that we've seen two very different styles of male speaker. And Dr. Hannah Critchlow's style of speaking very different to mine. Uh, I'm not trying to say, women, you need special help with your speaking. I'm not trying to say, make sure that you stand with your cervix in a special place, or make sure you wear the right bra. I always feel like I'm wearing the wrong bra. Uh, I'm not trying to say women need any special help. But when I started out as a stand-up comedian 10 years ago, I became very aware of this difficult question of how am I perceived as a woman on stage? Does it matter? Can I ignore it? You know, Joan Rivers doesn't seem to have bothered her for a second. Uh, there are other comedians who focus purely on feminism and want to talk about that. I was always worried about what was working for and against me about my gender and whether it mattered. And there is no one who can give you an answer on this. There are, there are a million different viewpoints on this. But one thing really hit home to me, and it was when I'd been doing comedy for a, a couple of years, and this will give you some idea of how difficult it is to do comedy, after a couple of years, I got my first ever Saturday night gig. Saturday night is a huge night in the comedy world because it's the night when the professionals come out. So if you're an amateur, it's one of the most difficult nights to get booked. So you can work every other night. Obviously, when I say work, I mean unpaid or for a used £5 note. Uh, but on a Saturday night, you're not going to get booked. Finally, I got booked for a Saturday night. And I was booked uh, by a promoter who'd seen me doing my first five minutes many times. And I got onto that stage so proud to be up there for the first time on a Saturday night in front of a room similar number to this. And for the entire five minutes that I was up there, I bombed to high hell and beyond. Um, yeah, forget denial of the Holocaust. This was like true tumbleweed. And whilst I was up there, my head split into three parts. The front part of my head was saying, just keep going. Keep going. It doesn't matter what you say, but just keep going. Just pretend this isn't happening. The middle part was saying, do something different. I don't know anything different to do. I'm not experienced enough. Do something different. And the back part of my head was saying, when this is over, all you have to do is choose the, myth the method by which you will commit suicide. 
And when I came off stage, I went to a brilliant uh, comedian at the back of the room, a guy who does loads of stuff on BBC Radio 4, Tom Rigglesworth, amazing comedian, and I thought, he will know. Is it a woman thing? Is it how I've done my hair? Is it what I was wearing? Is it how I was standing? Because the five minutes I'd done had worked before. And I said to him, Tom, what, what was I doing wrong? What can I do? And he looked at me, and he gazed into the middle distance, and I thought, he's going to say something so beautiful and profound now that's going to change my life. And then he looked me in the eye and said, Viv, just be funny. <laughs> and it was a terrible but brilliant moment. It haunted me and irritated me for many years. And then I spent a long time trying to work out in the same way that when many of us are worried or anxious or nervous about things, we get given the advice, just relax, just be yourself. Yes, but what does that mean? And for me, this became a very similar quest of just be funny. Well, just be funny is, is, is a good few years of work. And just be yourself and just relax is also a good few years of work and a lifelong quest. But as we've seen tonight from the other speakers, the most important thing of this idea of just be is about being true to yourself. The person who I think embodies this most in the world of women speaking is, of course, this woman. And the reason I've been able to start this project and get this conversation started about what does it mean to be a great speaker, what does it mean to be a great speaker as a woman, is this woman. It's only because of Michelle Obama that we're able to have this conversation. I think she's one of the best public speakers of the last 50 years. If you'd have told me when I was a child that there's going to be a black first lady of the United States and she's going to be one of the most admired speakers in the world, I wouldn't have believed you. She embodies for me this concept um, that's used a lot in improv um, and stand-up comedy. It originates from the improv teacher, Keith Johnson, called Happy High Status. And this is something you have to learn uh, in stand-up comedy, particularly if you're facing host hostility uh, or tumbleweed even, uh, if you're facing heckles, you need to occupy this status called happy high status. And happy high status is something Michelle Obama embodies very, very easily. Um, there's an example to prove to you that this is not a, a man-woman competition. There's an example given of another brilliant happy high status person to describe what this phenomenon is. If you imagine, and I can see this is quite a well-heeled crowd, so this would be quite easy for you to imagine. Imagine you have been invited to the Oscars, and you've had one outfit that you're wearing to the Oscars, and you're going to the after party, the Vanity Fair after party. And you have another outfit that you're getting changed into. And so you've taken time to get changed into your outfit, and you go to the next party. You're a bit late. It's black tie. And on your way in, you tap someone on the shoulder who's, who's doing the drinks. There's lots of waiters around. Everyone's in black tie. And you say, sorry, I'm late because I was doing my wonderful outfit. And you go over to see your friends. A couple of seconds later, the waiter brings your drink over. You turn around and you see that it's George Clooney. And you mistook him for a waiter which is an easy thing to do in a black tie context, right? If you're a bit flustered and obsessed with your own outfit. And the look on George Clooney's face is happy high status, which is, this is totally fine, I don't mind, this is an easy mistake to make, I'm fine with this. Okay, so this is slightly a projection fantasy for me also. Um, <laughs> right. Now, there's a really important distinction here between happy high status, which is this, and George Clooney's face giving you the drink, right? Have a dream later, ladies, have it on me. Uh, and that same person bringing you the drink being Donald Trump. That is the difference between high status, which is a business card, your position in society, the thing that you think you are, and happy high status, which is a relaxed, comfortable energy that you project with magnanimity, where all views are welcome, everyone can say what they want, and you're totally relaxed and fine in your own energy. So that is one thing I'd love for you to take away today. Every situation you're in, think, how can I be more happy high status? How can I be like George Clooney bringing Viv a cocktail? Right. 
The other person who's meant that I'm able to speak about this now, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who I've included because I've mastered the speaking of her name. Um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is one of the most brilliant examples of something Johnny uh, embodies as well. The wonderful, intimate energy of an introverted speaker. And introverted speaking, it's something that's totally new. It's only really grown up in the last few years. Uh, on TED, there are loads of fantastic introverted speakers. Susan Cain, Susan David, um, to some extent even perhaps someone like Brene Brown has got a sort of introverted nature, talking about vulnerability. Uh, someone like J.K. Rowling. Um, Hannah, uh, you're in very good company. J.K. Rowling would, would begin every speech with an apology that she hasn't prepared pro properly and that she doesn't want to be there and this is way out of her comfort zone. And these introverted speakers who say to us openly, so Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie would say openly, I am not a stand-up comedian, I am not a public speaker, I have prepared my text. She almost always speaks, uh, you can see here, from a prepared text. She's not going to stand here and be away from her text. She's a writer and she wants every word to be perfect. Uh, and she is a great example for me of this new style of finding your own way, a way that we haven't seen before, a way to be open and say, I'm nervous about this, but I'm going to bring what I have to say to you anyway. The other person who is a huge inspiration to me and is a brilliant example of why things are a little bit different for women, and I don't want us to get hung up on this. This is not supposed to be excluding of men in any way. I love men very much. I married one and pushed two out of my vagina. Um, I'm a fan. I'm a fan, men. I've done a lot for you. Uh, but the thing that Hillary Clinton's team talk about that is different for women is the paying of what they call pink tax. P-I-N-K-T-A-X, pink tax. And pink tax is the tax that all women have to pay, especially women in the public eye, to make sure that they look acceptable to other people. And the person who has been very canny about paying of the pink tax is this person, Angela Merkel. So, when she started her career in politics before anyone knew who she was, she took on a stylist and she said, your job is to make sure that no one ever writes about my outfit. And this was the result. <laughs> took many, many years for these pictures to build up. This poor stylist sourced the same suit in about 50 million colors. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen or read anything about Angela Merkel's fashion? No. This was an extremely canny move, an extremely canny mastering of the pink tax. The other very clever thing that Angela Merkel uh, did, which I would love for every woman to learn from, is to find a signature stance. This is known as glue fingers, <laughs> technical term. I also think of it as being like Mr. Burns off The Simpsons. And this is such a powerful symbol of her authority, this unique stance, that just the picture of the hands alone became the campaign poster for her party at one election. And this is a fantastic example for me of somebody who's found something. If you'd have said, oh yeah, if you want to be a leader, then stand like that. Well, no, nobody could have thought of that. It's something that she's found herself and gone with. And she's so brilliant that she even combines the two. <laughs> the pink tax and the brilliant uh, glue fingers there. Now, the perfect example of uh, Angela Merkel's greatness is exemplified by the one day that she allowed her stylist to take the day off. <laughs> which resulted in the headline, Merkel's got boobs. <laughs> so anytime, let's not look at that for too long. I want people to <laughs> go to bed dreaming of George Clooney and respecting Angela Merkel. So anytime anyone ever says to me, why are you making this gendered? And I'm making it gendered in a very gentle, gentle way, which I think a lot of us understand the context. There's nothing special or different about women, but the context is different. And I believe that those pictures prove it. I want to leave you with one last thought, and that is about the most important thing being finding your own style, your own voice, being comfortable in your own 
persona, the way that you inhabit the room. But it's also about simplicity and not trying to over-deliver, not trying to over-complicate things. And I want to leave you with the words of Michelle Obama's speechwriter, Sarah Hurwitz. Um, she's coming up soon as a guest on the podcast. I was very honored to interview her. She's an incredibly modest woman who worked um, with the Obamas for over 10 years. And she said that she and Michelle Obama had a rule for all of their speeches, and it was this. Never say to a group of people anything that you would not say face to face to one person. Incredibly simple, but also incredibly profound. Thank you. <laughs>